Good morning and welcome. This is 10 Years Hence. Our focus this morning moves from U.S. foreign policy toward China to global governance and the war in Ukraine. Our speaker is David Courtright, Professor Emeritus in the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. Professor Courtright is former director of the Peace Accords Matrix at the University of Notre Dame's Keough, sorry, Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. He is chair of the board of the Fourth Freedom Forum and a co-founder and board member of Win Without War. As an enlisted soldier from 1968 to 1971, he spoke out against the Vietnam War and filed a federal lawsuit against the U.S. Army to defend the right to dissent against unjust war. Professor Courtright is the author or editor of more than 20 books, including Governance for Peace, How Inclusive, Participatory, and Accountable Institutions Promote Peace and Prosperity, and Peace, A History of Movements and Ideas, both by Cambridge University Press and with George A. Lopez, half a dozen books on multilateral economic sanctions, including the Sanctions Decade. It is an enormous pleasure to welcome a colleague from just across the quadrangle to the Mendoza College of Business. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Professor David Courtright. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? I really appreciate it to be part of this program and uh, look forward to our conversation today. Um, I'm going to cover a, a number of topics. I'll first have an introduction to my story and some of my work. It's already been mentioned, some of it. Uh, but then I want to focus on global governance. What is it? What does it mean for international peace and security? And how is it relevant to the Ukraine war? And then I'll zero in on the Ukraine issues and some of the specific challenges that need to be addressed uh, in trying to bring justice to that uh, terrible conflict. And then I am going to, at the end of uh, the third section, come back to the China issue and offer a few uh, observations about uh, how China's role in global governance and potentially in ending the war in Ukraine. I'm a graduate of Notre Dame, 1968, uh, majored in history. Um, and, um, but really, I wasn't very sure what I wanted to do. And uh, I spent most of my time playing in the university band. Any band members here, band alumni? All right, yeah. Um, so this is a photo of me back in those years. I was a drum major of the Notre Dame marching band for the 66 and 67 academic years. Uh, but as I said, I wasn't really sure what was happening. And it turns out that 1968 was an unfortunate time to be available, an available young man in America. The Vietnam War was raging. Uh, the draft was at its peak. And in my hometown in eastern Pennsylvania, uh, almost everybody I knew had already been drafted. Uh, and so I graduated here, let's say, around June 3rd of 68. Went back home. Three days later, I got my notice from Selective Service, report for your physical for the military. Uh, so my head was reeling, as you can imagine. Uh, I hadn't really thought about the war. Stupid, but you know, I was insular here at our campus, and as I say, playing in the band. But I had to very quickly scramble. I knew enough that I didn't want to be drafted, because that was a one-way ticket to the infantry. Uh, and and I, because I was a musician, I decided I would uh, try out for and then enlist in the Army Band. So I spent three years in the Army Band, uh, defending our country by playing my trumpet and my trombone uh, and baritone horn. Uh, and I thought, well, that's, it's going to be an easy way to skate by and hopefully avoid being deployed uh, to Vietnam. Uh, but then I realized and was, was told and learned that, well, there are also Army Bands in Vietnam. Uh, and being in the band didn't provide any guarantees. Um, but the more I was in the military talking to soldiers who were coming back from the war, uh, I did something very subversive for a soldier. I read 
books about the war that they were going to send us to uh, and began to learn about what was actually going on in Vietnam, the more I was horrified and shocked uh, to think that our country was involved in such a conflict and causing so much brutality and suffering for the Vietnamese people. And so I went through a tremendous period of questioning and doubt. Uh, a colleague here at the theology department later told me I had a crisis of conscience. Uh, I didn't know what it was at the time, but I couldn't sleep. I was angry. I was upset at myself. And I just felt that I could not go on with business as usual and be part of a war that I knew to be so profoundly unjust and contrary to our own national interests. So I decided to speak out against the war, even though I was an active duty soldier. Uh, as you can imagine, our commanders were not very happy about this. Uh, and I knew that by speaking out, we were bound to get punished. Uh, but it was the only option that I could find palatable amidst a series of choices that I didn't really want, that I had to face. Uh, so I began to speak out against the war, and I became part of the anti-war movement. And a year after being in the Notre Dame Band drum major uniform, I had another kind of uniform on. Um, and this portrait was of an uh, anti-war uh, movement uh, called the Student Mobilization Committee. Uh, and I was asked to uh, pose for uh, this photograph taken by the great Richard Avedon, the great uh, portrait photographer. Uh, and it's not really about me, it's about thinking soldiers. And at that time, this is 69, 1970, there are more and more people in the country opposing the war. The anti-war movement became massive. Uh, and it was also among soldiers and veterans. Uh, so that was what I did. I became part of the anti-war movement. And all through that experience, uh, I found myself increasingly having a sense of, of purpose and direction, uh, working to prevent war, working to stop the Vietnam War, and maybe trying to work in my life and my career to prevent war in general, to try to understand and build peace. Uh, so this gave me a sense of direction. And really, in all the years since, I haven't changed my direction and where I'm going. So uh, this set me on a path. And after working in a number of organizations, uh, SANE, the Committee for a SANE Nuclear Policy in Washington, uh, helping to set up the Win Without War Coalition and other groups, uh, over the last 30 years, I've been privileged to be part of the faculty and the research team at the Kroc Institute and now at the Keough School. Uh, and one of my major works is this volume that was mentioned by Professor O'Rourke, uh, which is really my attempt to kind of synthesize uh, historical developments and the contributions that advocates for peace have made through history over the last couple of centuries, uh, with the emphasis especially on the, on the current period. Uh, and in that process, I really began to see the value of working for peace and the many contributions that, that organizations have been able to make in this area. I also worked in a number of uh, research projects with Professor George Lopez uh, at the Kroc Institute. Uh, and we began to focus on economic sanctions as uh, a policy approach that's non-military but can be coercive uh, as a way of addressing uh, human rights abuse, uh, wars of aggression, the proliferation of nuclear weapons, and the like. Uh, and throughout all of this research, uh, I've tried to focus on certain values in terms of, and going back to the peace volume as well. Uh, I'm not a pacifist, a pure pacifist, in the sense of opposing all war. And I don't oppose the military. I was part of the military. Uh, and I believe in a, an approach that's pragmatic, uh, that is oriented towards policy. Uh, I think we have to be realistic. Uh, as peace advocates, just as military planners need to be, understand history and the causes of armed conflict and the fact that aggression sometimes does occur. Uh, and also, I, find my, I like to portray and believe that I am uh, patriotic. I love my country. I've always believed that peace is patriotic. The right to dissent is one of our most fundamental freedoms in America. And we cherish it. And we use it all the time. Maybe we use it too much these days, it seems. 
but it's an important part of what it means to be a democracy. Uh, and what we have done so often in these anti-war movements is try to warn our government that these wars are not just, that they're not justified, and they're likely to lead to disaster. And we had a, a similar debate on this on the Iraq war. And this is my uh, most recent book, uh, A Peaceful Power, a Peaceful Superpower, uh, just came out a couple weeks ago. Uh, and uh, I can do a little shameless self-promotion here. Uh, here's the, the real deal. And there's cards there on the desk if anybody wants to order a copy. Um, but this was a book that uh, is a book that examines the worldwide opposition to the war in Iraq, uh, a war that we argued was unnecessary, that was based on false claims about weapons of mass destruction and uh, Saddam Hussein being behind the 9-11 attacks. None of that was true, uh, and people all around the world mobilized and organized against it. Uh, and I often think now that our political leaders should have listened. Uh, but we went ahead and the war was a disaster. Uh, I've looked recently at the US Army's history of the Iraq War, it was published by the Army War College, and I cite it quite often in the book. And their conclusion was that the war was a, quote, strategic failure, unquote. And it was also a humanitarian disaster. You know, we, we just had a number of observations in the country, thinking about 20 years since that uh, beginning of that war. And many things were mentioned about some of the issues that I just said. Uh, but really the most important issue that we need to think about is the, the human cost. Uh, there have been a number of scientific studies by epidemiologists and others that looked at the consequences of the Iraq war for the Iraqi people. Uh, and the most respected study by a, a team of scientists at the University of Washington, their conclusion is that about a half a million deaths by violence occurred from 03 to 2011 as a result of the war. Violence from many different sources, but violence that was set in motion by uh, the invasion and occupation. So we really believe that it's important to uh, carefully reflect and only use our military when it's absolutely necessary uh, for missions that are truly worthy of the sacrifice of our men and women in uniform. Then a major book that I did just before the uh, Iraq book was this study on governance. And governance is important here, and here's where I want to get into some of the substance of our uh, discussion today about global governance. Uh, governance is important as, a, as an analytic framework that helps us understand the functioning of different systems of governance, not just by government itself, but by private sector, by civil society organizations, by international agencies, uh, all of the different institutions that regulate and manage how we as people interact within our nations, our societies, even in our university and beyond. Uh, and by looking at that from the perspective of global armed conflict and peace building, uh, we've tried to distill key principles about what works in governance to enhance the prospects for peace and also for economic development and prosperity. And there are many empirical studies that we evaluate in this book. And one of the things that we find is that often the conditions that are likely to be associated with reduced armed conflict are also associated with greater prosperity, greater economic development. So the key principles that we find undergirding all of effective governance systems are equity, uh, inclusion, and accountability. Uh, inclusion, equity, accountability. And when those qualities exist, the systems of governance are more likely to be healthy and beneficial for societies and for developing peace. So this concept of global governance has a, has a long pedigree. Uh, the great philosopher Immanuel Kant uh, in 1798 wrote the book uh, um, per, um, Pros Permanent Peace, um, Perpetual Peace, sorry, Perpetual Peace. And uh, in that book, he outlined his thinking about the moral and political foundations for preventing war. Uh, incredibly far-sighted. And he came up with this triad concept that the combination of free and democratic states, 
uh, open trade relations, what he called hospitality and the ability to go across borders to trade and to engage in commerce, uh, combined with cooperative organization uh, would contribute to world peace. And he advocated uh, this idea of a global federation of free states, a, a federation of democracies, uh, and that this would help to build international peace. Well, of course, it's a very utopian vision, and we haven't gotten there <laughs> over 200 years. But it turns out that a lot of the ideas that Kant was playing with and some of the core concepts really are very relevant and are part of a world today that is increasingly multilateral, uh, that engages in many different systems of cooperation among states. So this chart uh, has two lines. The bottom line is the increasing number of international organizations run by governments. Uh, and I'll go through a few of those for us. Uh, and that's been steadily rising over the years. Uh, and we see today there are about 800 major organizations that are intergovernmental in nature uh, that play a fundamental role in almost everything we do in our lives. We're not often very conscious of them, uh, but they are helping countries, 200 countries in the world today, 8 billion people to interact and get things done. The top line is the growth of international non-governmental organizations, social organizations, civil society organizations. And they've been rising at a even more, a very rapid rate. Uh, and this reflects the fact that when we think about governance, we think about society today, it's states are the foundation, of course. But the private sector has a huge and enormous impact on society and politics. And so does civil society, the non-governmental organizations that have been multiplying rapidly uh, and that are involved in many protest actions, but also in many advocacy and research and legal and other initiatives to try to promote values for human rights, democracy, or whatever it may be. Uh, so all of this has uh, helped to create a more multilateral world. And why do states want to join organizations? Because they have challenges that they can't meet only by themselves, or that even a small number, a small number of states working together cannot address. There are genuine and increasingly critical global challenges uh, that we have to face. Well, migration, for example. There's never been more migrants in the world. It's a huge crisis politically in many countries. You can't solve it one country at a time. Uh, the problem of nuclear proliferation. The problem of transnational terrorism. Okay. Environmental and resource issues. Uh, and trade. So there are many issues that uh, increasingly drive nations together and that spark the rise of non-governmental organizations which then try to influence the governmental uh, process. There's also been a steady rise in the number of international agreements, uh, conventions, treaties uh, that have been formally ratified by states, usually registered with the United Nations. Uh, we see a, a steady growth in that pattern as well. Um, so I think if we um, have our topic of 10 years hence, uh, I think we can reliably predict that the process of multilateralism, the process of international organization is likely to continue uh, and will probably continue to increase in the scale. Uh, global governance is here to stay, but let's hope it's more effective and uh, can get its job done better in, into the future. Uh, so just a few of these organizations. The World Bank, we all know about this, created in the wake of World War II as a key mechanism for helping states that are shattered by that war rebuild. Uh, and, and now increasingly in the world, helping states that face various development challenges uh, to assist them in, in rebuilding after conflict is a major factor. Uh, I worked with the Peace Accords Matrix as a Professor O'Rourke mentioned, and we have a big project in Colombia monitoring the implementation of the peace agreement. And when I would visit uh, in Bogota, we would often go to the World Bank headquarters because they were a key agency helping Colombia rebuild after their 50-year civil war. And I just noticed in the news this morning uh, that there's been a major study produced uh, by the World Bank in cooperation with the European Union, the United Nations, and others uh, looking at the challenges of trying to rebuild Ukraine after this horrible war. Uh, 
uh, and putting a dollar figure, something like 400 billion, I think it was. Uh, and, and that'll begin to identify what the challenges are and how it can be done. Uh, so it's a major agency. It's, it takes up a whole block in Washington, DC, uh, and is important in many parts of the world. Uh, one organization to highlight here is the International Criminal Court. And uh, actually, a Kroc Institute graduate, Rosette Nacivo Morrison, is a senior official there. Uh, but the ICC came out of the Rome Statute of 1998. is an important evolution in international law to begin to define what is aggression and what are the crimes committed in war, and how do we hold perpetrators accountable through some mechanism of international law. Uh, so there are 123 countries that are part of the ICC. Uh, the United States is not a party to the treaty, which is interesting because there are some members of Congress who are saying that we should bring uh, Putin and some of the Russian criminals, uh, war criminals, to the ICC. But we don't have standing, so it's an issue. Well, Russia is not part of the ICC either. Um, the African Union is something, African Union is someone, uh, an agency few of us probably know much about, but there are regional organizations like the AU all over the world, uh, and uh, they have a critical role to play uh, in helping to advance the prospects of development in their own region. Uh, the key and most important international organization has been the European Union. It's, it's quite remarkable uh, how evolved it is, and when you think about that it's only about 30 years old. Uh, and actually, most of the international foreign policy of the EU is only about 20, 25 years old. They've evolved uh, very rapidly. I mean, it looks like chaos a lot of the times, and it is. You, know, you have to negotiate among 27 states. Uh, but they've managed to make it happen. And the EU is uh, really something of an embodiment of Kant's vision. It makes sense, Kant was a European, um, but um, so it, obviously the states who are part of the EU have to have procedures of democracy uh, and respect for human rights. Uh, they work cooperatively in their foreign policies. States can do their own thing, but many of their policies now are done in coordination with the other states. Uh, and it's been uh, an amazing uh, experiment that so far is working. And the irony is, of course, that you know, Putin and the, the Russian, or the Kremlin leaders uh, have been uh, worried about Ukraine becoming part of the EU. But because of their war, the EU is stronger than ever. And it's united and providing tremendous amount of support for Ukraine along with the US, uh, for Ukraine as, along with the US. Um, and this evolution of the EU is really important. It's a, a major partner for the US. Almost everything we try to do globally, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the Ukraine war, we do in partnership with the EU. And if we think historically about the significance of a cooperative organization uh, ensuring democracy and human rights and less armed conflict within its own region and globally, coming from Europe, the place where the two world wars evolved, and now it's a place where there's this experiment and this project to treaty, really try to build towards peace. It's, I think, significant. At the center of the global system, if you will, of global governance is the United Nations. Uh, in the US, our political leaders talk a lot about the uh, rules-based international order. Uh, and it's sometimes unclear what that really means. Uh, for some people in the world, they, well, we respect the United States. We're, we have many uh, allies. But some states think, well, if this means US military hegemony, or that Washington's going to try to tell us what to do, uh, maybe they're not so enthusiastic about it. So you know, there's uncertainty about what this concept means. But really, it should mean the United Nations and the UN Charter. Uh, we don't think that much about the United Nations, don't use it that much in our foreign policy. We used to, and we should do more, I believe. Uh, and some people may think, well, the UN is sort of an alien entity. Uh, it's based in New York and Geneva and other places, but uh, it's not relevant to us. But I remind you that you know, the United States helped to draft the charter of the UN. It was mostly drafted in the State Department during the 1940s uh, in cooperation with the UK and other states. 
Uh, and it's an agency that we created in order to, as the charter says, save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Uh, and it's played an important role in many conflicts. Uh, uh, at the heart of the security architecture of the UN is the UN Security Council, uh, which is the, the body that has authority under the UN Charter to use force. The Charter says that nations are prohibited from using military force against other states, full stop. But there are two exceptions. One is if the Security Council authorizes the use of force, and the other is, in Article 51, the right of self-defense. If a nation is under attack, uh, it has the right to use force to defend itself, as Ukraine is, is doing now. Uh, so the charter is nice in language, and the Security Council is set up to do the work, but it's fundamentally flawed because it has the veto power of the five permanent states, uh, the US, Russia, China, UK, and France. Uh, and there have been many occasions when one or another of those permanent states have used their veto. Uh, and in the case of the Ukraine war, Russia didn't even bother coming to the Security Council because it knew it would be uh, voted, uh, it would be denied authority. Uh, by the way, the US did go to the Security Council twice in 02 and then in 03, seeking authority for using military force in Iraq. Uh, the, the phrase that's put into the resolutions is, quote, all necessary means, unquote. And twice, uh, the Security Council refused to go along with the US on that uh, language, and therefore did not grant authority for the US to use force in Iraq. But even when the Security Council cannot act, the General Assembly uh, has a provision that it can be called into special session uh, to engage in specific decision-making and, and reflection on international crises. Uh, and the General Assembly is like the World Forum. And every fall, when they open the General Assembly, world leaders show up and they give speeches and foreign ministers come. And even though the UN lacks a lot of real uh, operational authority, it is the place of political importance. And it does have legal authority. So states come and they bring critical issues to either the Assembly or to the Security Council. Uh, and the General Assembly has three times taken up the issue of Russia's war in Ukraine. Uh, soon after the invasion began, uh, they voted overwhelmingly against it. Uh, then in the September and October, when Putin declared these four new provinces that they've conquered and occupied, uh, the Assembly met and specifically said, we do not recognize and do not accept uh, this new uh, territory that Russia has seized, supposedly, uh, from Ukraine. And then just a few weeks ago, on the uh, one year anniversary of the Russian invasion, uh, they adopted a resolution uh, demanding that Russia uh, unequivocally and without condition withdraw all of its forces from Ukraine. It was approved by a vote of 141 to 7. Uh, so Russia didn't have many backers. Uh, on the other hand, there were 32 countries that abstained. Um, so uh, it was a positive vote for Ukraine, although with some ambiguity. Um, and this brings me now to more focus on the Ukraine war and what are the issues, how do these international rules and agencies relate to uh, the current conflict, and, and what do we know from peace studies and from other peace processes that might contribute towards bringing about a just and sustainable peace uh, that restores Ukraine's integrity. Before I do that, though, let me just talk for a moment about the visit a few weeks ago by Cardinal um, Robert McElroy. Did any of you have a chance to see that at the, at the Notre Dame Forum? Uh, I think a very significant address by the Cardinal, who's one of the leading thinkers among the US Catholic bishops, and even globally, I would say, on issues of war and peace. And Cardinal McElroy uh, reminded us of the, the church tradition uh, and Catholic teaching on war and peace. There is a presumption against war, that war is sinful, uh, that war causes human suffering, that war uh, is in, uh, a violation of the divine teaching 
to respect and love and care for others. Um, and also that the church has increasingly shown a preference for nonviolent approaches to international conflict. And Pope Francis has been particularly uh, uh, forceful on stating uh, the preference for nonviolent approaches. Um, but McElroy did remind us that there is also the tradition of just war teaching, just war uh, principles that has been part of the, the church dating back to Augustine and even before. Um, and this is that sometimes under extreme conditions with very specific uh, uh, conditions, uh, it may be necessary to use force for self-defense. And so we know about some of these principles. You know, it should be a last resort. There has to be proper authority, uh, civilian immunity, these various principles that say if these conditions are met and it is for defensive purposes, then sometimes war is necessary. So even within the context of the church's presumption against war, there are sometimes acts of severe aggression that a special case must be made. And, and as McElroy said very powerfully in his address, this is one of those occasions in Ukraine. Uh, they have the right to defend themselves, and it is just for us to help them in that struggle. But he did remind us uh, that it's not enough to just think about fighting a just war. We have to think about what is the strategy for building peace. Our obligation as Christians, as Catholics, is to work for peace, even in the midst of armed conflict. And he asked, what is the strategy for the termination of this war? And he admitted that Catholic teaching is lacking. It doesn't fit within the just war framework. It doesn't fit within the nonviolence and presumption against war framework. So we have a lot of intellectual work to do and moral clarity that we need to think about how we can try to help end this war in a way that uh, respects Ukraine's right of self-defense and its necessity of restoring its territorial integrity and its national dignity. But it's a tough struggle, and it's so difficult. This war has been going on, and we see the papers uh, constantly filled on TV with so many of the stories um, of this bitter conflict. Uh, we, in the United States, have properly, as I said, provided a lot of support. So has the European Union and many other states. Um, but we have to begin to question uh, what are the scenarios for how this ends. Is uh, military victory possible? What does military victory mean for Ukraine? Uh, is it possible for them to drive out all Russian forces from every inch of their territory? It's certainly a just demand, uh, but is it possible? And if this war becomes a stalemate, as it has over the last few months, uh, doesn't that raise additional moral challenges and issues uh, for continuing to fight uh, versus the question of whether there are any other solutions, other means? Certainly one of the tools that is now being used very extensively is the imposition of economic sanctions, uh, cut off Russia from international commerce and support as in this protest act in the, against the war. Uh, and uh, Professor Lopez and I, of course, have studied this area and it's sort of been a, a, a demand function for us to be responding to many requests for uh, analysis and trying to understand uh, the nature of the sanctions that are now in place. Uh, they're very significant. There are more than 11,000 entities that have been targeted with sanctions in Russia. Uh, and the, the goal is to uh, try to cut off the financing of the war. So most of the major banks in Russia have been uh, sanctioned. Uh, they've been cut off from the uh, international uh, communication system, SWIFT, for uh, banking transactions. Uh, and their National Reserve Sovereign Fund uh, has been frozen, at least the half of it that exists in hard currency, and mostly in the, uh, in the European Union and in the US and the UK. Uh, so that's had an impact. It's also uh, the sanctions are designed to try to cut off the exports to Russia of semiconductor and uh, other advanced technologies 
that can be used in weapons and uh, targeting of missiles and the like. Um, and those measures are in place. And then there are also, of course, the attempt to cut off uh, Russia's revenues from energy exports, from oil and gas in particular. Uh, so all of these are underway over the last year, and they're pretty significant. They, obviously, they have not stopped the war. And really, if we have to, if we uh, analyze the sanctions, we have to think about uh, what are the purposes of sanctions, and what can they achieve, and what can they not achieve. Uh, and from our research that I've done with Professor Lopez and others, uh, the, the findings are that sanctions are highly effective at signaling, at upholding international norms. So in this case, uh, against the act of aggression and to uphold Ukraine's right to self-defense and to national dignity. Uh, they are also effective many times at constraining, at limiting the capacities and repressive resources of states that have been targeted uh, with sanctions. Uh, so in this case, the export controls and the arms embargo on Russia are designed to try to uh, limit its capacity for waging war. Uh, and the question of coercion, though. Often we think of sanctions as the main goal of this is to coerce the Kremlin to cave in and withdraw their troops. Uh, but the research shows that that almost never happens, not with sanctions alone. Uh, sometimes the use of force, as we're seeing now, is necessary to go with that. Um, but uh, so the purpose is, we have to be clear, we can, we're not going to end the war through sanctions alone. But it is uh, raising the price that Putin has to pay to continue this military effort. Uh, I'm doing a, another lecture on this topic uh, next week in Grand Rapids at the World Affairs Council. And uh, we're showing that. Uh, Yes, it has uh, led to uh, devaluation of the ruble. Uh, there's now growing deficits in Russia's spending. Uh, there have been some declines in exports. But what's happened is that Russia has found uh, ways to get around those export controls. So it's interesting. If you look at the data, so for quite a while in the first half of last year, uh, the exports to Russia really dropped. So people were saying, yeah, sanctions are working. But then suddenly we began to see that exports to Russia from the uh, Central Asian states, Kazakhstan and uh, Uzbekistan and some of those states started going up. And so obviously Russia was getting its goods uh, through those states and, and having them come in. And states like China have increased their purchase of uh, Russian oil and are exporting a lot of products to Russia. We don't know, and really it's not possible with current technologies to really say whether all the uh, most advanced uh, microchip and um, semiconductor products are being uh, contained or not. We know the exports have, they went down for a while, they've gone back up. They're a little bit below where they were a year ago, but there's, you know, they're not as low as we would want them to be. Uh, and we don't know for sure whether the attempt to kind of limit, especially the uh, targeting technologies, has had much effect so far. But nonetheless, I think the sanctions are important. And one of the things that we found in our research is that, uh, as I say, what can sanctions do and what can they not do? They're often quite effective as a bargaining tool to set up a bargaining dynamic as, as leverage to can provide some uh, inducement for the adversary to make concessions. Uh, and Lopez and I have found this in, in a number of cases where the offer to ease some of the sanctions in exchange for a concession from the adversary helped to bring the parties to the bargaining table, in some cases helped to bring about a positive negotiated outcome. So this, I think, is important to consider as we move forward on the sanctions policy. Uh, and a number of us are, are trying to put together uh, scenarios of what would it look like to do partial easing of some of the sanctions as an inducement for Russia to come to the table and begin to uh, accept some of the demands for withdrawal of its forces? And ultimately, I think we do need to see this as a war that requires a diplomatic solution. All wars end in some kind of a negotiated agreement. Even if there's a victory, there is some sort of signing ceremony that takes place. And in fact, talks are underway. Uh, between the two sides. They were able to 
uh, renew the deal on exports of grain uh, to help ease uh, grain shortages in developing countries in particular. Uh, there are agreements that have been made to protect the nuclear stations at Zaporizhia. Uh, so there, there are talks underway. Now the question is, is it possible to envision a diplomatic solution? Well, certainly not at present. Uh, all observers and, and all the people involved, you know, the Kremlin and the Ukrainian government have said it's not the time to talk. Uh, I mean, China offered a so-called peace plan, but if you look at it, it's, you know, very thin. <laughs> There's no actual specifics, a lot of nice principles, but nothing uh, really significant. But I'll come back to the point that Russia, uh, that China could play a role if there is a serious diplomatic process. But one thing we've learned about diplomacy and negotiation from the Peace Accords Matrix Project here and from other researchers around the world is that uh, diplomacy, effective diplomacy requires preparation uh, and there needs to be planning in advance. And there was a great article just this past week by former Ambassador Tom Pickering, uh, one of the most seasoned, experienced uh, American diplomats over four decades, former ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, Pickering wrote a piece about uh, planning for the end of the war. And he made the point that uh, there needs to be a much more careful and engaged process to start thinking through uh, what this would look like. And in our research, uh, we've identified some ingredients that I'm convinced will be necessary, and I'll identify a few of these. And, and we could talk during the Q&A about some of the conditions and the specifics of a negotiation uh, in terms of the issues, territorial issues, uh, et cetera. But uh, just to stay here on the process, uh, we know from international peace agreements that the degree of international involvement and support helps to increase the, the prospects for a successful outcome. In other words, agreements where there are many states involved, where there are international guarantors, where there are international agencies and mechanisms established, uh, those peace processes are more successful. So for example, a, a ceasefire. Russia keeps talking about a ceasefire. Someday there will have to be a ceasefire. Uh, but ceasefires don't work unless they have significant, robust international monitoring. Uh, and it's best if there are specific countries that come in and provide uh, the resources to make that possible. Uh, we also know that in all of the different parts of a peace process, there need to be uh, third party uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. Because the, the parties, they sit down and sign something. That doesn't mean the conflict's over, not by any means. Uh, there are gonna be still many differences and you need a mechanism for resolving them. Those mechanisms have to have a third party involvement to be, have a higher chance of success. And there's a number of other things that really uh, need to be part of, uh, of an international process. Um, and I think particularly around the issues of security. Uh, now, we have heard about peacekeepers, I'll put them up on the next slide, but uh, we need international security forces uh, for effective peacemaking. Uh, and there are many studies that have been done on the success of peace agreements or not. And when there are third party security forces, uh, the chances of success are much higher. If you just leave the two fighting countries to their own devices, uh, most of those conflicts go right back into war. But if there's a large international mission, often through the UN, and certainly the UN will have to play some role here as the kind of uh, host and overseer of a lot of this process. Uh, you need that, and then you need security forces. So this is a, a part of a force that's still in place uh, in Kosovo. At the end of the Yugoslavia war, then Kosovo uh, has been seeking in independence and autonomy. Uh, and it's been an ongoing conflict, but over the last 10, 15 years, first there was a NATO force brought in, and now there's an EU security force. Uh, and what I like about this image is it, it helps us to see that uh, this is not just, you know, kumbaya, we're just going to look at what's going on. You have to have weapons. You have to be capable of uh, intervening if a conflict starts to rise up. Uh, so you need robust forces. Uh, and we know that peacekeeping works. Uh, there's a huge amount of research uh, on conflicts that have had 
uh, UN peacekeeping and other forms of peacekeeping. And overwhelmingly, uh, the, the evidence shows that peacekeeping helps to ensure a more sustainable and robust peace process. So I like this image of uh, UN peacekeepers. Uh, and there are women detachments now in international peacekeeping. Uh, and I don't know if you can read the, the phone of uh, that one officer there. And she says, call me princess. <laughs> I say, well, be careful of that automatic weapon, though, too. Uh, but you know, these peacekeepers, you know, sometimes people make fun of them. But when they have proper rules of engagement, when they are empowered to address uh, some of the violations that exist, uh, they can make a difference. And it's quite likely that in the negotiations around Ukraine, uh, there will be a withdrawal of Russian forces. Uh, there can't be peace until Russia does withdraw its forces. How is that going to be monitored? And what's it going to look like? And there needs to be some international presence. Uh, and then when those forces are withdrawn, there's going to be lines of uh, difference in, I don't know if the border zones per se, the nature of that's still to be determined. But that will need to be policed as well. Uh, so again, you'll need forces to be part of that. Some people have said maybe there needs to be uh, some process by which uh, Crimea and the Eastern Donbass people can have a vote or a referendum about their fate, whether they should go with Russia or China, uh, with Russia or Ukraine. Uh, now, if that were to take place, then there has to be some systematic, systematic objective international process to really ensure some kind of fair decision making. Uh, so all these things, essentially, uh, I'm arguing that there needs to be a significant international presence in order for the peace process to have any success and for uh, Ukraine then to have some security going forward. Uh, Ukraine did put out a nice uh, set of documents on their plan for security. And they rightly uh, fear for their future, even if this war ends. Uh, will Russia come after them again? So there needs to be some kind of mechanism in place to ensure that they have security and protection. Uh, whether it would be part of NATO, who knows, may not be the best thing in terms of trying to keep Russia uh, uh, at bay, but it's really up to Ukraine. Uh, but some kind of security uh, defense mechanism will be necessary uh, for Ukraine into the future. Now, thinking more broadly, and just a final set of comments about China. Uh, we heard from Professor Eisman last time uh, the difficulties uh, with China. And I, I agree with all that he said. But I also believe that uh, we need to recognize the reality of China's rise in power in the world. And it now is uh, one of the most important states. Uh, and there's. Nothing we can do to stop that process from happening. Um, and I think we've made, we are making a significant mistake uh, to increasingly uh, isolate and uh, develop a policy of confrontation uh, with China. Uh, I don't see what possible benefit that could come from that. And any kind of military action against China would be a disaster. Of, monumental proportions, and it has to be avoided at all cost. Uh, so those in Washington who talk about this so blithely, I think, are uh, making a great disservice to our country and to the cause of international security. Uh, I believe we need to engage with China. We don't have to accept their system at all. We disagree with it totally. Uh, and we don't uh, quiet our criticism of their human rights abuses. Uh, but we cooperate with a lot of countries around the world because we have common interests. Going back to my original point, there are problems we can't solve without their help. Uh, and the problem is we've been pushing uh, China towards uh, a more of a partnership with Russia. And this is the meeting this week that Xi and Putin had. Uh, and I, I raised this question with Professor Eisman, that uh, shouldn't we be doing what we, what we can to try to uh, move Russia and China, keep them apart, and certainly not push them together. Uh, and I just think that uh, we can work with China, and we did work with them in, in the past, and, and we're intertwined with them economically and in terms of trade in so many ways. Uh, and 
uh, getting back to my earlier points about the solution to the war in Ukraine, uh, we'll need to have partners. And we'll need to have partners who are, uh, if not uh, allies of Russia, are, are more neutral. So those 32 states that abstained in the UN General Assembly, well, China's one of them, but also um, Turkey, uh, India, major states that have big influence and that Russia would be more likely to work with and listen to uh, in a peace process. Again, it doesn't mean we sell out our principles in any way. Uh, the withdrawal of all Russian forces from Ukraine is the bottom line that can't be compromised. But within that context, we can find ways to work together. And I think this meeting that Putin and she have had this week, uh, what's interesting to me, and a slight ray of hope, is what they didn't say. Uh, there was no commitment of military goods that I saw in any of the reports uh, or any indication that uh, China was going to give uh, military support. Uh, and there was more talk about this supposed peace plan. Uh, so again, there is no peace plan. But uh, if China can play a role and it can get Russia to be part of a process to move to the table, uh, I think it can be to our benefit. Uh, I really think we need to be moving in this direction of engaging rather than isolating uh, and try to understand that our power uh, is a, a great power, but it's best exercised through multilateral cooperation with other states and that by working together we can achieve uh, genuine success and benefit for ourselves and for states like Ukraine that we want to help. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Uh, time for questions at this point. So we have a couple of microphones. And if you would just put up your hand, I think we have one right here. And we'll begin with you. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak. Um, my question was, uh, you kind of were making this point about how we don't necessarily have to agree with everything that China is doing, right? But we can still sort of work with them and, and try not to push them toward Russia. I guess my question is, is sort of, A, how do we balance that maybe criticism of some of the human rights abuses and some of those things with still trying to cooperate? And on the other hand, is there sort of any you know, hard limit on if the abuses go past this point or if nations are doing these kinds of things, then we should really shut them off and no longer cooperate with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we work with a lot of states around the world whose policies are frankly quite repugnant. Um, and we can do things, uh, but it doesn't mean that we're any less critical on their human rights record or their uh, abuse of minorities and other problems that they may be having. Uh, so, you know, this is what states do all the time, you know, and you, you have to focus on the things that really matter for our national interest. You know? And then the values that we have as a nation, those two things are intertwined. Um, but I think it's uh, certainly very possible. Um, and I, I like to think that as we promote democracy and human rights in other countries, uh, we continue to focus on our own human rights and democracy here. I think we uh, do best in promoting these values by leading with example. Uh, and we have a great democracy, but we face threats and challenges. And democracy is always a process. It's always unfolding. And we ought to be constantly striving to uh, strengthen it. Uh, in terms of you know, what would be the red lines, uh, to me, it would be if, if China directly challenges us as a nation and our security, you know, if they're confronting our military coming into our uh, country somehow and uh, trying to uh, impose uh, their will on us, well, then obviously we back, we resist that. Um, but I don't see them doing that. They're an imperial power within their sphere of East Asia. Uh, but uh, I don't see them as a direct uh, threat to US security. I mean, we have our fleet in the West Pacific. Uh, and they view that as we're in their neighborhood. 
Uh, and so that's a source of friction. Frankly, I don't think we need to be over there that much. You know, we have to take care of our own security needs. Um, can't be the policemen of the world. Uh, and we've tried to do that too much, I think. Um, so we should be focusing on our national security interests. And this is just a further point. I said earlier on that we need to be realists. Um, and that's the political philosophy of realism. You know, my colleague, Professor Mike Desch, and others. Um, and I think that means that we f use our military means and our diplomacy to fundamentally protect our national interests and don't overplay the military hand. And military restraint is sometimes more effective than uh, over military deployment. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Question here. Um, right. Um, thank you for the lecture, Professor. Um, I'm trying to wrap my head around um, the sanctions on crude oil coming from Russia. Um, India has been the second largest buyer of discounted crude oil from Russia. And ironically, uh, not ironically yet, but uh, India was condemned by the US and the European Union for buying discounted crude oil. But um, when it comes to refined oil products uh, that come out of India, uh, United States has been the highest buyer. There has been like a 23% rise in these uh, refined petroleum products that were purchased by the US late last year because of the holiday season. Um, I'm trying to understand how effective uh, the sanctions are because it seems like business is just business. Um, it's more about, that's what I'm trying to understand. So if you please. Yeah, well, it's a good point. And, and the fact that India and China as huge developing states have been buying more Russian oil, basically more than counteracts the fact that the European Union uh, has significantly reduced uh, their imports of Russian oil. Uh, and we're not a player in this because our trade with Russia was never much to begin with. And, uh, and we uh, have more than enough oil here. Um, yeah, I would say that overall, the oil, uh, the energy sanctions have had little or no impact in terms of trying to really reduce uh, Russia's revenues. There are some signs that perhaps it may be trending down now. This innovative idea of the price cap that's been developed uh, may be uh, having some effect. Uh, and that's uh, a way to affect all of the uh, companies that are shipping oil because it affects the insurance. You know, it goes after the basic uh, pricing structure for trade. Um, so um, I think and a number of colleagues and, and, and political leaders around the world uh, have suggested uh, lowering the cap. I think it's now $60 or something a barrel. Uh, and if we lower it, then that, and it still works, then that means there's going to be d diminishing revenues for, for Russia. Um, but yeah, I think your, your point is well taken that uh, given the enormity of the uh, energy market uh, that Russia has been dominating uh, in many respects, and we do as well, uh, it's really hard to turn off the spigot. Uh, and it's also a resource that everybody needs. So still, uh, one would hope it'd be a, accelerating the trend towards renewable energies. And uh, it has to some degree in Europe. Europe has its own Green New Deal. They have a different name for it, the Green Deal. Um, and they've been accelerating their spending in that area. Um, this, by the way, is another reason why China is important, because of course they have a big producer of a lot of renewable energy technologies and, and resources. Uh, and if we want to address the global problems of uh, climate and environmental, uh, degradation, then we need China's cooperation as well. But yeah, mm -hmm. good question. We have a question here. Uh, professor, thank you for coming here. Um, I'm from Grand Rapids, so I'm glad you'll take your message there soon. Okay, good. Um, on the topic of sanctions, um, it seems the longer sanctions are in place, the more loopholes seem to be seized to avoid this, the penalty of the sanctions. Uh, should timing be a, an issue when sanctions are imposed? Should there be sequencing of 
the strength of sanctions based on their endurance, how does that play out in promoting peace? Yeah, that's yeah, a, a good point. There are actually cross-cutting uh, factors here. You're right that uh, the longer sanctions are in place, like with the export controls, the target figures out a way to find the resources. On the other hand, some of the cumulative effects may uh, begin to ha have an impact. So with the, with, uh, the uh, finances and the currency, uh, there was a big impact initially, then they restored it, but then they've had to use a lot of the reserve funds to, to prop up the ruble, and there's now training down in the budget. Um, so ba basically I'm saying that uh, we don't really have clarity in, in the empirical data on the timing issue. It, it cuts both ways. But one way, is that one way in which it can be to the advantage of the sender states and to the effectiveness of sanctions is to substantially boost the enforcement effort. And we're still like in the dark ages when it comes to sanctions because uh, you have now 35 countries representing half of the world's GDP uh, supporting these sanctions, uh, but you don't really have a, a rigorous coordinating mechanism. The EU has something in place and, and Treasury and State Department are doing a lot on our side, um, but there needs to be much more strategic attention, the same way as you would if you're in the middle of a war, and this is a kind of an economic war, uh, where you weigh all the actions that are out there and how you can uh, shore up the weaknesses and strengthen where you've got possibilities. So w one thing that uh, I'm just doing, I'll be talking about this at the Grand Rapids uh, uh, World Affairs meeting that I'm coming to next week, um, there needs to be uh, a greater focus on enforcement at some key strategic border control areas. So we're thinking now uh, that uh, in the Central, Central Asian states, uh, their customs and border control mechanisms are not you know, cutting edge, not uh, at top levels. And uh, could there be a joint mission by the US and the European states to go to those states? And right now we're sort of threatening them with secondary sanctions. Well, okay, but we have, what about some assistance? Can we help them establish monitoring mechanisms uh, at the border crossings that might begin to chip away at some of that uh, flow that's coming across now? So that's just an example. Uh, we saw this in the, in the lingo of sanctions experts, it's called sanctions assistance missions. Uh, and we did have that in the Yugoslavia sanctions in the 90s, uh, and it was fairly effective. Uh, it's essentially a much more coordinated, focused effort on uh, halting the leakage at key points where we see commerce that's violating the sanctions. Would you put Turkey in that group? It seems to me that while the Turks are part of the EU effort, um, that area through the Bosporus and the Dardanelles is a huge leakage point, and it doesn't seem to me that I read much about them being cooperative. Correct, yeah, they're playing the middle game. I think they, uh, more than China, actually see themselves as perhaps the host of some eventual negotiated process, and maybe with some other states. Uh, so they're playing both sides. Uh, and, but the potential is enormous because there is so much of the uh, traffic coming through there, uh, and I don't know really what kind of uh, naval inspection process there may be right now, probably none, or very little. Uh, but this is something that could be done. Uh, during the Iraq sanctions, uh, and with the Yugoslavia sanctions, and in other cases, uh, there have been naval task forces uh, that are, have the purpose of going out and stopping ships, inspecting cargo, uh, bringing technology to bear, uh, and uh, that process could be done. Uh, I think it's worth looking at. You would need Turkey's cooperation, of course, uh, but here again, you know, Turkey's playing both sides and they want to get some benefit from our side as well as from Russia. Uh, and uh, we, can, we can work with them. We can figure out what they want and what we need in terms of inspection of cargoes and maybe that'll be possible. All right, other questions? Uh, thank you so much for the lecture. Uh, I was wondering, so Russia has to export, China doesn't have to buy, that puts China into a position of power. So how crippling do you think this will be to the Russian economy long term if China just decides to take advantage of Russia and just 
buy at like the lowest possible price. I'm not sure I, uh, could you rephrase it maybe a little bit more? Sorry. So China has a lot of power over Russia right now because they don't have to buy, but Russia has to export. Right. So the question is, how damaging do you think this will be to the Russian economy long term? Yeah, I think yeah, there are long term prices that Russia is paying here in this, what's going on now. And losing the European market, for example, is huge over the long term. And that's where the pipelines are right now. And they don't go the other way yet. yet. Some do, but not many. So uh, there's a lot of uh, downside for them. And, and China has enormous leverage if it wanted to use it uh, to squeeze Russia and convince it that really it ought to uh, go for a negotiation. Uh, this kind of gets me back to my, my theme about China. You know, if China would shift just a little bit more towards pushing Russia to realize what an incredible blunder they've made in this invasion uh, and work with them in a, then in the negotiation process, that could be decisive. They have far more leverage than we do, and actually now more leverage than the European states. Uh, and you know, I think China is also somewhat like Turkey, playing a game. They want to be, they are increasingly a world leader. Uh, they're competing, competing with us on the global stage. Uh, but as I said, I don't think we need to demonize them. We can figure out how we can work with them. And this is really one of those uh, critical areas. Um, I was uh, reading this piece just this week by Fareed Zakaria um, in the Washington Post. And uh, he was going back to uh, Henry Kissinger when there was, and Nixon and Kissinger opened up to China in the 70s. Uh, and in the process, they improved relations with China, but also with Russia. Uh, and we're able to kind of play the two sides off against each other. And I was thinking, wow, here I am kind of channeling Henry Kissinger. <laughs> but, but I think it's, there's some value in what, what Kissinger represents is realism par excellence you know, of international policy, of balancing powers one against the other. Uh, there could be so much payoff uh, if we could figure out a way to start to engage, just, you know, now she's had his meeting with Putin, let's get a meeting with Biden and, and start to work out what it is that they want and what we can offer to improve our relationship with them. David, if there is some thinking that if the international community wants to get tough with Russia and bring this to an end, mm -hmm. <clears throat> that they should vote to pull for an indefinite period the SWIFT code, the International Banking Transaction Code managed in Brussels, yep. which would prevent the movement of money both in and out, mm -hmm. paying their bills and receiving funds for things they've exported. Right. Um, we, th we thought about that with regard to Iran, and the U.S. Treasury Secretary said this would mean, you know, guys with suitcases full of banknotes mm -hmm. trying to manage transactions. Um, why hasn't that happened? And what are the unanticipated contraindications, the downsides mm -hmm. of doing something like that? Yeah. Well, I think with Russia, there has been a, at least a partial uh, delinking from the SWIFT communication system. So. Uh, their banks cannot uh, engage in transactions in the normal way because of that. Um, so, uh, but I think more needs to be done uh, and uh, tighten up the existing financial restrictions, uh, make sure that other banks are also uh, blocked. There are still some Russian banks that are functioning. Uh, and I think it's the area where we can make the the biggest long-term cost for Russia will be uh, the draining of their resources and their sovereign fund. Now, before this war, as you know, Russia built up this massive fund of hundreds of billions of dollars, and about half of it was in hard currency. So that half, they don't have, and uh, they're not going to get it until there is some kind of settlement. Uh, the rest, uh, they've been draining down pretty rapidly in other currencies. And that's accounting for the continue, now the renewed decline of the ruble and uh, growing national uh, 
budget deficits. So, I mean, you're onto something here. This is the place where uh, it looks like there could be real impact uh, in terms of their financial position. Uh, and uh, once they lose their resources, their financing, then they, they don't have much exports and, and import you know, earnings. So, uh, so they're, they're vulnerable extremely on, on the financial side, I think. Yeah. All right, thank you. We have a question right here. <laughs> push, the, push the button. You'll want to push that button up. Okay. Um, I could be wrong, but um, recent polls indicate that most Americans are opposed to a continued and increasing <clears throat> military and you know, financial aid for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. why, why do you think there's not more anti-war sentiment expressed publicly in this country? Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like it's pretty quiet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, just on the latter part of your question, uh, wars, it depends on what the wars are about. You know, there's not uh, anti-war movements on every use of force. Uh, in this case, uh, I think most people would agree with, uh, with His Eminence uh, Cardinal uh, McElroy said that this is a, a just war and Ukraine has the right to defend itself and the U.S. is doing the right thing. There's certainly overwhelming sympathy for Ukraine around the country. The Ukraine flags are still flying and, uh, and should be. Um, I think U.S. opinion is, uh, it is shifting a bit, you're right. And, and this is a problem with the current strategy. You know, we're spending about 100 billion or so a year now on this. Um, that's a huge amount of money. And uh, American taxpayers, you know, you're already starting to hear some of this, you know, why should we be spending all this money over in Ukraine and we have problems right here? And, uh, and that's been a, a, a right demand, I believe, by a lot of people that we should focus more on our domestic needs and less on military uh, adventures overseas. Uh, so I do think there's gonna be something of a time limit on, on the level of support that we're giving them now. Uh, and I think the same thing is evolving in Europe. There have been some, quote, anti-war rallies in Germany just a couple weeks ago, uh, although it was mixed. Some of them were pro-Ukraine, but some of them were uh, calling for halting any further assistance to uh, Ukraine. Uh, and and it's, a, it's an odd mix of groups involved. There's some like, like far left, but also some like, you know, kind of fascist or pro-fascist far right groups involved. Um, so, I think this is another reason why uh, the idea of just fighting it out till there's a final military victory. Uh, again, it's a, you can understand why President Zelensky has this view, uh, but is that gonna be sustainable if it goes on for a lot of years? Um, David, Richard. a week ago, the governor of Florida, who is not short of opinion on many <laughs> subjects, declared that um, Ukraine is not part of the American interest, that we have no interest there, mm -hmm. and that we should begin to wind down our support for that. I'm wondering if you could revisit the American interest in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, the governor is having trouble with his remarks uh, on this. And, and you know, my own view is that we should be continuing this support, but we also, as I've indicated, we should be encouraging more of a, of a peace process. You know, this is a strategic interest of the United States. Uh, Europe has always been a, a core part of our security uh, and vis-a-vis -vis Russia uh, and uh, with Turkey and, and this whole region is, is critical to us uh, because of our partnership with the European states and the EU um, and because of our historic rivalry with Russia. I mean, I, I wish we could find a way to have, uh, go back to where we were in the early 90s with Russia. Uh, uh, and I think NATO expansion was a big mistake, the way it was done. And uh, so they do have grievances. It doesn't justify what they've done by any means, but. Uh, the people of Finland don't see that. Yeah, well, and that's, you know, I, I, I pay attention when Sweden and Finland want to join NATO. <laughs> These are countries that have been distinguished in their diplomacy for peace and support for uh, 
uh, international cooperation. So they see a threat, and, and it's a real threat. Uh, and Putin has gone off the deep end in mm. his military aggressiveness. Uh, and the states that border Russia are girding for battle, and they fear they may be the next on the hit list. Uh, so we, because of our historic commitment to these countries and to NATO, uh, we can't just walk away, I don't think. What credibility we have would be gone. Um, now, as I said, we can do it with a little less military bombast and, and more peacemaking, but our influence does depend on being committed to those we've made allies. All right. I think we have time for another question. Um, why did Russia agree to the boundary with Ukraine, given the tremendous percentage of Russian speakers in the Crimea and that strip of land, including the Donetsk Basin? And um, there's that saying that borders should be crunchy, not slippery. I know the Balkan area changed its boundaries. The Czech Republic separated from Slovakia. Did Russia agree to the boundary? Was it a good, good deal, a good decision for them? Should they have opted for that strip of land, including Crimea, to mm -hmm. be part of Russia? Yeah. Well, obviously, uh, the current leadership of the Kremlin doesn't believe it was, but it was a decision that was made. Absolutely, and it was verified in treaties and in international agreements at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and there have been other periods through the history where Ukraine has had independence. Um, so it's, you know, this question of boundaries and territory, Russia's claim to be able to control Ukraine is an imperialist you know, artifact, if you will, from the earlier ages. Uh, and they're still trying to live that reality. Uh, but it's too late, it's, you know, that's done. And especially after this war, uh, it's hard to imagine if there would be a referendum in some of these places for do you want to go with Ukraine or with Russia, uh, which way people will go. But uh, Russia is, I don't think, making many friends by bombing and destroying so much of the, the countryside, uh, the, it, exactly where it claims to be defending Russian speakers. Uh, so, you know, it's, I, I think there's no credibility to this argument that they're making. It's, uh, it's entirely as a, a way to try to gin up some domestic support for the policy. Uh, but no one abides it internationally. And as I say, these boundaries are set. They've agreed to these in previous treaties. Uh, so in order to make a claim, they have to essentially completely undermine international law. And nobody's going to buy it. I, you know, they, like I say, they had seven states <laughs> support them in their policy in terms of the these uh, UN General Assembly votes. So. I have one more question, which <clears throat> takes us from Europe, and Ukraine, and China to the Western Hemisphere. In recent days, I've been watching with increasing dismay, actual horror, at events in Haiti, which is by all arguable uh, tenants a failed state. Mm -hmm. The Canadian Prime Minister has said yesterday that he has no interest in sending Canadian troops in to help restore order, uh, to stand up a government. Uh, Mr. Biden clearly thinks that's an untenable move for the U.S. What's going to happen to Haiti? <laughs> yeah, well, I really have no idea, and I haven't focused on Haiti policy in a long time, but. You know, we, we did play a role back in the early 90s uh, when there was another episode of meltdown and a lot of violence in the streets. Uh, but at that time, you had Aristide, who had been elected president, the former priest, uh, who had a lot of popular support. So he was kind of a unifying figure among the people, generally. Uh, but I don't see that right now. I don't know enough to say from uh, looking at their situation. So. Uh, Do you see an international organization like the UN uh, sending peacekeepers? It's possible. There is a, a sanctions resolution that's been adopted for Haiti. So that, uh, that would indicate that the UN is, is engaged, and it means they'll continue to be engaged. So we might see that. Uh, yeah. well, ladies and gentlemen, David Courtright. Thank you. Thank you. So for your trip back across the quadrangle, <laughs> uh, a memento of us should you, should you forget. Right. Uh, uh, you're always welcome here, as are you. Thank you so much. We'll see you again in a week's time. Thank Care you. for yourselves. Thank you.